You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 240, Colossians q and I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Pretty good. Do we want to talk about our uh, epic fantasy face-off in our football league or not? Yeah, no, we can. I, I, hey, I was competitive. I made it. <laughs> I lost by five <laughs> points. And if I would have started my normal people, rather than trying to make a big move, I would have won. But I didn't do that. You know, I swung for the fences. I picked up some new guys. I tried to do something big. It didn't pan out. It backfired, but hey, I came five points yeah. short. At least I made well, this me sweat is, a little bit. This is Maury's greatness right here because I had bi week troubles and he just he put on his uh, draft wizard hat and I was able to to fill the gaps. Yeah, no, you're crushing it. You're, That's what great teams do. You're 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 leading it. You're number one in the league, and I think you've only lost one game. So you're like eight and one yep. or seven and one. I'm or... seven and one. Yeah, I, I, it makes me wonder now how in the world I lost that other game. I just I must have <laughs> I must have like you know done something where while Maury was asleep, you know, and I didn't have his supervision. You're crushing it. It's uh, it's it's uh not fun for us guys here on the bottom who are just trying to. Uh, find a way to get into the playoffs. So uh, it's it's it's, well, it's amazing how fast the time goes. It's almost over. It's already halfway through. It's, it's like, like halfway through. It's already yeah. November. Uh, where does the time but go? I'll take it. You know, because my other leagues, man, I, I can't buy a win. It's just you know, it's, I'm struggling to stay at 500 and a couple and a couple I'm I'm, I'm underneath. It's just it's such a weird weird season. Yeah. You know, but there you go. The pugnacious pugs have Patrick Mahomes, so that solves a lot of problems. Who went to my college, so since he's doing so good, I just pretend like I'm doing good because he's my college quarterback, so go Red Raiders. Well, he's the real deal. So he is. It's awesome. It's awesome. All right, Mike. Well, I want to remind everybody that uh, we're going to be in Denver uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, November 16th, I believe, is that Friday at 7 p.m., in the upper room at the it's community, the commu- yeah, community church. Yeah. Yeah. The Denver community church. Uh, so please, it's free to the public open to everybody. We hope you'll join us at 7 PM there in the upper room and bring your questions and hopefully we'll have a good time. Yeah. Well, I, we usually have a good time at those things. So I would expect no less. Sounds good. All right, Mike. Well, uh, we've got a handful of questions here specifically about the book of Colossians. So, I'm ready, Mike, if you are. Yep, let's jump in. All right, our first one is from Leon. I was raised a Trinitarian, and I am still one, but I find some difficulties in the New Testament concerning the Holy Spirit. Often or almost every time Paul greets a church, it is with the phrase, grace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, without mention of the Holy Ghost. Colossians 2.2 2, describes the mystery of the gospel as the Father and Son's plan. Again, no mention of the Holy Ghost. In Revelation, we see this amazing throne room scene, but again, very little of the Holy Ghost. So what are we to make of this as Trinitarians? Why is there a perceived lack of acknowledgement of the third figure of the Trinity? Yeah, I think the key word there is perceived, and I I would say it's, it's a misperception. You know, generally, this the angle of the question feels like a hermeneutic of exclusion, an interpretive approach that is fixated on exclusion. In other words, the idea that if something isn't mentioned everywhere or even mentioned in a preponderance of places with specific phrasing, that it has no role. And I think that's flawed. Uh, I would say... You know, if you, if you actually look at Colossians two two, it doesn't seem to really say what I think is lurking in the in, in the mind of the of the uh, question here in the mind of Leon. So let me just read that, or I'll read the first two verses, in Colossians two here. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, 
to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Well, God's mystery isn't the Holy Spirit. It's Christ, because Christ's work on the cross is the thing that unites Jew and Gentile because he is the promised seed. You know, mentioned in Genesis 12, 3 and other places after God divorced the nations, that it was through Abraham's seed, one particular seed, of course, where this situation would be reversed. And the seed there has to be physical, so it has to be Christ. So it really has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit anyway, in that sense, in that verse. So I think I think we're, we're sort of over-reading or maybe under-reading uh, Colossians 2.2, 2, uh, again, with this sort of hermeneutic of exclusion. Again, Christ is the mystery, the means by which salvation would be provided. And it and so the wording makes sense in terms of what it's what the subject matter is. Secondly, I would say the Spirit is included along with Jesus in statements about the gospel elsewhere. How can we possibly conclude that the Holy Spirit isn't part of the gospel, the whole you know, the plan in passages in a number of passages? Let me just give you a few examples. I'll give you some examples from Paul, since you know Paul's the author of Colossians. So there's actually a, a number of these that we could look at, but Romans 1, 4, uh, that you know, the Son or Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. I mean, you have verses like that, that that link the Spirit to the resurrection, which is the key to the plan's fulfillment. So how in the world can we say the Spirit isn't, isn't an equal partner in all this? You know, Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ, in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Again, it's the spirit who baptizes people into the body of Christ. And the, and inclusion in the body of Christ is where you get your, you know, your assurance of salvation. Okay. It, again, it's, it's indispensable. You have Christ's body, but, well, again, who, who's the mechanism by which, you know, individuals, believers are joined to that body, united to Christ, to use another Pauline phrase. What's well, the Spirit? You know, Romans 8, 9, you, however, were not in the fl- are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Again, just that whole mechanism about the body of Christ. The Spirit in these passages is absolutely indispensable. It, you know, the Spirit is required you know, for, for this, these things to be true. Romans fifteen sixteen, uh, that Paul was called to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Again, there you have that 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 link. So in in this case, you even do have the Spirit brought into the discussion of this union of Jew and Gentile. Okay, so the Spirit doesn't get you know excluded. He might get excluded in some places where Paul is talking about Christ as the mystery. And the mystery itself, again, is this inclusion. But here we have the Spirit, you know, is the one who brings it all together, you know, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. I'll just, you know, do some rapid fire here. 1 Corinthians 6.11, uh, Paul mentions uh, several sins in the preceding verses, and he says, Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I mean, if that isn't, you know, just, just look at, look at the, the way these, these things are juxtaposed. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus and and the Spirit, again, they're set side by side there. Now, God isn't there, you know, if if we're operating by, again, a hermeneutic of exclusion. You know, is God out of the picture now? No, there's no requirement that all three persons be mentioned in passages that relate in some way, where where there's, there's a doctrinal item, in this case, the mystery, the gospel. There's no requirement that all three persons need to be mentioned in passages that discuss that thing. I mean, there's no rule for that. And so to observe where the Spirit is not included in some of these and conclude, well, I guess he's not equal, that, again, that, that's just a flawed approach, uh, even though I can see how you know, people could be steered you know, in, in that direction by someone who sort of wants them to focus on the exclusion. Uh, let me try to find another one here. Uh, you know, the grace of the Lord Jesus, this is uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, there, there are all three in there. You know, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Galatians three fourteen. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles 
There again, there's that mystery thing from Colossians, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Again, linking the spirit into the mystery there, even though the spirit isn't mentioned in Colossians 2 2, he's brought into the equation in other passages. I, I think you get the point uh, at, at this point. You know, it, you know, who gives us everlasting life? Is it Jesus or is it, is it the spirit? You know, now, now we might be inclined to think of John three sixteen. Oh, it's Jesus. It's the work of Jesus. I'm like, well, the Holy Spirit is actually talked about that way in certain passages. Second Corinthians three six, uh, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Galatians six eight, the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. And you know, through him, so there you have, there you have in Ephesians 2.18, through him, Jesus, then you have the Spirit, then you have the Father. You know? So uh, again, this is, this is just something I think for the general listener here to be wary of. Don't let people steer you in a certain direction through the hermeneutic of exclusion. It, it, it's tactically not kosher, if I can put it that way, because there is no rule that says all three persons have to be listed in every passage that talks about a subject that all three persons have something to do with. You, you might get all three of them there. Maybe the preponderance of the verses you don't. But if you get two out of three in all the other ones, and, and it's very evident that all three have a role to play in the same thing, well, that tells you something too. It tells you that all three are at the same level. It tells you all three are indispensable. It tells you all three, you know, you, you pull one out and it's not going to work. You need all three. And so, uh, again, the way we think about Godhead, I think we need to be careful in our, in our methodology. And the last thing I would say here is the very idea of the new covenant. I mean, think about this. Think of the whole question from this angle. The very idea of the new covenant, which Jesus said his body and blood are the guarantors of unites Christ and the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit was part of the prophesied new covenant in the Old Testament. Passages in Ezekiel and Jeremiah specifically mention the Spirit in connection with the new covenant. And there's Jesus in the upper room saying, this is the, you know, the blood, my body and blood of the new covenant. Okay, you know, it, <laughs> the Spirit belongs there. The Spirit is an equal partner. Um, again, so we, we need to be careful about our method here. Heath has our next question, and he asks, the New World Translation Bible of Jehovah's Witnesses puts the word other in Colossians 1. By him all other things were created. He is before all other things. Some (laughs) Jehovah Witness apologists defend this by saying lots of English Bible translations insert other in various places where it doesn't appear in the original Greek. How would Mike respond to that? Except for that one. (laughs) Well, I, I would. Here's how I would respond to it. I would say it's silly. Uh, again, you know, the, the I, I think this is Colossians one sixteen that the phrasing is drawn from. If you're going to do this in Colossians one sixteen, it's purely, it's contrived. It's a purely contrived theological insertion by the Jehovah's Witnesses. There's nothing in the Greek text to justify inserting the word other, and you know. You know, we know the drill. The Jehovah's Witnesses just do this sort of thing because they can't win the argument with exegesis of the text that actually is there. So now we have to we have to insert words in you know that aren't there so that we can win our argument. Again, that that's a little thing I like to call cheating. But this is what they do. They just move the goalposts when they need to. They cheat. You know, I, I think that the shoe would it would be interesting to have the shoe on the other foot. It would be this would be like anti-Jehovah's Witnesses inserting or deleting things in verses to make them look even worse. How about inserting the word God, capital G-O-D, every time the name Jesus appears just because the two are juxtaposed in certain verses? Certain verses we get God, capital G, and Jesus. Well, why don't we just put God everywhere where the name Jesus, you know, see, Jesus is God. Look at that. It it belongs here because it, it shows up in some other verse. Again, it's ridiculous. It's silly. I'll bet the Jehovah's Witnesses would cry foul if we did that. Well, again, if they're going to cry foul there, then they need to stop just just putting words in passages that try to make their theology. You know, it, it's cheating because they can't win the argument on exegesis. Marissa from Slovenia 
has two questions. And the first one is, I have a question about the passage about the Colossian heresy, Colossians 2.8. I've read some commentaries on the Storkeia. Did the proto-Gnostics and or some Kabbalistic sects employ the elements of water, fire, earth, air, literally as some kind of tools in their ceremonies? Or was it rather invoking the entities that were supposed to rule this elements by some spiritual bribes or passwords? Is there a connection to the passage in Matthew 12 where the Pharisees accused Jesus of using the power of Beelzebub? Yeah, I mean, Jesus never used, uh, we, we actually covered this when we did an episode on, I can't remember what the number was. We did an episode, episode on exorcism uh, as part of the Messianic mosaic. Um, yeah, I can't remember what, what number it was, but we, we, we have had discussions both in that episode, and I think maybe one other Q&A about Jesus and um, you know exorcism, or maybe I'm thinking about part of my, my demons book at, at any rate. What, what's interesting about Jesus with exorcism, let's just start there, is that there were exorcists in the Jewish tradition in, in antiquity. You know, the, the, the Kabbalah stuff is so much later. You know, I, I, don't, I really don't even think we need to care about what somebody's saying about the Bible a thousand years after the biblical period, because they're just making stuff up in Kabbalah. It's just you know, mystical stuff. But, but there were exorcists in the first century. And, you know, you, they left writings, they left, you know, different incantations on different objects and whatnot. I mean, this is a whole, like, sub-discipline of biblical scholarship. And what's interesting is Jesus doesn't – let me back up and say it this way. All of those the, – their incantations and such within the Jewish community when it came to exorcism – and you could apply this to the Christian tradition, too – they all have some appeal to a higher authority to cast out a demon. Jesus never does that. And, and again, scholars have noticed this. He doesn't use formulaic phrases. He, he, do, he doesn't do the kind of things that, that his contemporary uh, exorcists, you know, even, even those within his own community, do. He doesn't appeal to a higher authority because he doesn't need one. Okay? He is the authority over demons. And this is, this is something that just sort of stands out. Uh, you know, within the whole context of exorcisms in the gospel. So, you know, they're, they're going to accuse him by, you know, using the power of Beelzebub because they know he's not doing it in their name or with their consent or with their approval. And he's also not doing it the way they do it. And they don't want to believe that he actually is the higher power <laughs> to which they have to appeal. So what's left? Well, you know, we're, we're just going to say he's appealing to some entity that's more powerful than the demons, and the only candidate you really got for that is Bells above, okay, you know, the Satan figure. So, you know, there, there's a certain logic to why they say this, and it it, it can be kind of comical, if, again, if you really sort of know the backdrop of this. And it, it's, it, it, you know, it's pretty poignant in terms of its theology that, that here's the one standing before them that, that needs no higher authority, and in fact— is equal to the authority that they appeal to, and they just don't, they don't realize it or they're unwilling to accept it. Now, the earlier part of the question about the Stoicheia, you know, it is true when we talked about the Stoicheia, you know, one of the, 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 one of the contexts in which that term is used is to refer to water, fire, earth, you know, the, the fundamental elements you know, of the universe as, as they were conceived, you know, back, back in the first century. So we, we, we can't necessarily conflate that understanding of Stoicheia, the fundamental elements, with the Stoicheia, who are spirit beings, even though, you know, there are texts that do have them overlapping, you know, to some extent, because of the very ancient idea that the, for instance, the elements of weather, okay, uh, you know, were controlled by either by God or some other, you know, entity or something like that. So there was this cosmic battle going on behind things that people experienced uh, meteorologically or just in terms of you know, natural catastrophe, that sort of thing. So, uh, again, it, it's conceivable that they could have done this. I mean, I don't. I'm not a student of Gnostic ritual, so I don't have. I'm not aware of any specific examples. However, I am aware that the Manichaean sect, who, if you know something about the Manichees, that it's an early Jewish mystical sect. You know, they they actually did part of this. You you can find these sorts of things in their you know, ritual language and their, their, their ceremony. And of course, the Greek mystery religions, they, they did use these elements and they do, 
you can find them as part of, uh, again, ceremonial statements or phrases, rituals, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's a verbal element and then there's a physical element as well. They would use fire and water and whatnot. So when it comes to those two things, yeah, I mean, you can, you can find examples there. I don't know specifically about the Gnostics, though. Um, Gnosticism, again, tends to be this sort of amalgamation of you know, streams that, that, that flow into you know, what would become known as Gnosticism. So I wouldn't be surprised. I just don't know any, any specifics. This is actually sort of a good thesis question. <laughs> Uh, if, if Marissa was a graduate student, I'd say, oh, that's a good idea. You know, it's just, you know, do a survey of the literature and tell me if you find anything. And if you do, that's your thesis, you know. So that, that's the best I can do with that one. All right. Marissa also wants to know uh, that Mike mentioned Egyptian Hermeticism as one of the mm -hmm. sources of the Proto-Kabbalah. Is there a historical mm -hmm. proof that the Hermetic texts influenced later Zoroastrian doctrines and practices? Or did they both evolve from a common root? Yeah, it, it, it's really, it's kind of difficult. On, on one hand, let's just start with Egyptian Hermeticism. Okay, we have to realize that what we think of as Egyptian Hermeticism was produced in the Hellenistic era, the Greek era, because it's in Greek. We don't have Egyptian texts that refer to themselves as, you know, in this way, you know, Egyptian Hermeticism, again, produced in the Hellenistic era, was, was allegedly, it's presented as the teachings of the god Thoth. You know, well, it, it sure, it, it would be kind of nice if we had sort of an Egyptian original that could actually validate that idea. But we don't. Again, th this material is, is Hellenistic in origin. Now, since that's the case, the Hellenistic Empire was one that preceded um, well, how do how do I want to put this? You know, you've you've got your if you think in the flow of biblical history, okay, you, you've you've got your your Persian, you know, you get your Babylonian Empire, you get your Persian Empire, then you get the Greek Empire, then you get the Romans. Okay, so yes, Hellenism, you know, preceded the New Testament era, again the Gnostic era, you know, by several centuries. We get that. Zoroastrianism though was a was a precursor. Okay, to this. So Zoroastrianism would actually be something around before, technically, you know, the, the Egyptian Hermeticism, again, that is actually Greek. Now, they are pretty close, though. So it would not be a surprise at all if, you know, there, there was some cross-fertilization here. And, and this, this is typical of the of Hellenistic culture. They, when Alexander spread his empire over the ancient world, he, he didn't like root out all pre-existing religion and all that kind of stuff and just dump it, throw it away and ban it. He doesn't do that. He does focus on syncretism. Okay. He, he, he wants to Hellenize what's there, not eliminate what's there and replace it, you know, with, with only Greek thinking, but he wants to sort of, uh, again, baptize it. If I can use that, that catchphrase, uh, he, he wants to inject, you know, Hellenistic thinking into that and marry the two, then come out with, somebody who is positively predisposed toward him and his empire and, and, and Greek culture. So you're, you're, you're naturally going to have some relationship here between them. But, but chronologically, again, technically speaking, um, if we're talking about this thing we know as Hermes Trismegistus, you know, and all that, all that sort of stuff, the, the Greek title of the Egyptian god Thoth, again, this, that's Greek in origin. So it would actually come after the Zoroastrianism. You know, in, in most of the tractates, I think I have a little. Let me, let me just look up something really quick here, in a um, little entry on Hermes Trismegistus. This is from Barrett's New Testament background. Uh, C.K. Barrett. This is the late 1980s, 1987. He writes, Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, is the Greek title of the Egyptian god Thoth. Trismegistus probably represents an Egyptian expression meaning very great and served to distinguish the foreign god from the native Greek Hermes. In most of the tractates, Hermes himself or a similar divine figure communicates secret knowledge, gnosis, about God, creation, or about salvation. Again, gnosis is a Greek term. Uh, he communicates you know, certain ideas about those things to a disciple who is sometimes but not always named. The revelation is generally given in the form of a dialogue, in which the disciples share is limited to asking questions and expressing admiration. The date of the Hermetic writings cannot be established with certainty, but it seems probable that most of them are composed between AD 100 and 200. That's a little, you're still in the, in, 
you're still in the throes of the Hellenistic world, even though the Romans are in power, you know, you've, the world speaks Greek. Again, you, the old, the old thing, why was the New Testament written in Greek? Because everybody spoke Greek, you know, and Greek culture has spread everywhere. So you're still basking, if, if I can use a positive term like that, you're still basking in Greek thought in these eras. So this is definitely after the Persian period, you know, so first century, second century, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, you, we have to just keep this in mind with respect to this question. But again, since Alexander had a policy of syncretism, marrying things together, rather than their, than their eradication, this is certainly, um, it's certainly possible that you're going to find similar streams or similar threads in both corpuses, the Zoroastrian literature, and then, you know, the, the Greek literature, the of you know, Hermes Trismegistus. Justin has a question about Colossians 2.16. Torah observant Christians say evangelical Christians interpret this verse wrong and that Paul was really saying the reverse. The Colossians had started to observe the feast of Yahweh and were being judged for doing so. Is this interpretation possible? You know, I, I'm I'm not completely sure what what the question is angling for. So it is the idea of the question that Jewish believers were criticizing Gentiles for not doing Jewish things, or is the idea that Gentile believers were criticizing some among their own number for doing Jewish things? It, it, that, that seems to be the last one there. The second one seems to be where this is going, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, in either case, though, I would say that Paul's statement in the very next verse, okay, sort of answers this question. Now, so 2.16 says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or, and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Uh, again, and then I'm going to assume that, that this, that the question is, the Torah observant Christians are saying, well, you know, the, these these Christians at Colossae were starting to do Jewish stuff and then getting criticized from people within their own community or or maybe even Jews. I mean, it, it, it's hard to believe that Jewish believers would criticize them for doing this because that would sort of be kind of what they want or they might feel good about it. They, hey, they become more like us. So it, it seems to me that maybe what the question is angling for is you have Gentiles criticizing other Gentiles for doing, doing Jewish things. Regardless of that, like I said, the next verse to me, answers the question. Here's the next verse. These, again, these questions of food and drink, festival, new moon, or Sabbath, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Uh, again, the law is not the reality of our right standing with God. Christ is. He is the substance. And when we went through Colossians, we camped a little bit on this term, the Greek term, you know, translated substance here in the ESV. And we talked about how it, it's a, a term that is used to represent that which is real, you know, the, the reality. So the reality of our, of our right standing with God that Paul has been talking about in, you know, earlier in the passage, you know, being rooted and built up in him. It's not being rooted and built up in the law. Okay. The reality of our right standing with God is Christ. It is not the Torah. It is not the law. If a follower of Jesus wants to be Torah observant, fine. Okay, you know, it, it, if if he doesn't want to be Torah observant, fine. It, it, you know, this is I, th I think the point. But even if you say that they were being unfairly criticized, these Gentiles for doing Jewish things, I mean, the, the Torah observant Christians that are probably sort of in the background of this question you know, want people to follow the law, you know, fine. If, if you have a Messianic congregation and you want to observe the Jewish calendar and you want to observe Sabbath, you want to teach, you know, for whatever reason that you should do this or that, and food and drink, okay, so long as it doesn't topple the gospel, so long that it doesn't replace the gospel, because these things are a shadow of things to come. They're, a, they're a, a dim glimpse. But the reality, the reality is Christ. Again, Paul is explicitly clear here. These things do not replace the gospel. The gospel does not depend on them. The gospel didn't get to be the gospel through the assistance of the law and its rules. Okay, I don't know how else to, to say it. 
you know, if, if Torah observing Christians use scripture to convince Gentiles they should be Torah observant in terms of salvation, then they are suggesting that Christ is insufficient. Okay? And, and again, that, that's clearly not a biblical you know, New Testament teaching. Why convince someone of the shadow when they already possess the substance? So this is, as Paul makes it, I think, an issue of preference and nothing more. So don't get anyone, let anyone pass judgment on you, either for not doing it or for doing it, because these things are a shadow. Christ is the substance. Anyone who makes you know, the Torah more than Christ or flips this around that the Torah is the substance and Christ is the shadow is just acting on some inner proclivity, you know, inner impulse to want salvation to be linked to their performance or personal practice. I mean, let's just be honest about it. They have some sort of guilty conscience or some sort of some sort of internal need to want to be congratulated in some way that they contributed something through their own works to their salvation. Okay, that is that is contrary to New Testament teaching about the nature of the gospel. Christopher has always heard in sermons that the primary reason that Paul used a scribe while writing his letters to the churches was due to poor vision, possibly even through not necessarily connected to the thorn in the flesh referred to 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Is mm -hmm. it possible that the reason that Paul emphasized that he wrote in his own hand in Colossians 4, 18 is due to having cataracts or similarly poor eyesight, which made it difficult or clumsy for him to write himself as opposed to using a scribe, particularly in light of his writing, of his writing being referred to as large in Galatians 6.11. Yeah, and, and the large reference there may just refer to Paul's use of capital letters, not necessarily size. You know, it, it, again, it, is it possible that, that this is a poor vision thing? Sure, it, it's possible, you know, but there's no evidence for it. I mean, that that's just being honest. I mean, it's a speculation. It's all it is. Uh, there's nothing that rules it out. There's nothing that, you know, really suggests it either. Uh, again, it's it's pure speculation. You know, in, in our last episode on Colossians, you know, I mentioned an article on this phenomena, you know, literacy and using, you know, scribes that that got into this whole thing about writing, you know, being able to to write and not just read uh, or speak a language, you know, that, that wasn't your first language. Uh, in the ancient world. So I, I would recommend that. That article is accessible to my newsletter subscribers. Again, the bigness of letters may have been to emphasize Paul's ability to write. It may have just been the use of unsealed letters. Again, these are all speculations as to why that particular comment is made. So, you know, I, is it plausible? You know, uh, there are lots of other you know, reasons, again, offered in that article. That yes, that are that are also speculation because Paul doesn't actually tell us, neither does any other verse, but that are certainly workable and make sense. So, you know, well, I I don't think I could bring myself to say this is implausible. Uh, I I would say it's probably less plausible than some of the other options. But if people are interested in this, again, if you subscribe to the newsletter, you can go in and get. Uh, get that article. I don't remember the author uh, right off the top of my head, but you can listen to the episode on Colossians 4 where I give the title. Uh, but if you're in the uh, in the newsletter archive where I keep the articles, you, you can see the title of the article anyway. So it's, it's in my, uh, with my own hand or something like that is in the title. So you could, you could get that and read the whole thing. It's actually pretty lengthy and, and kind of interesting as far as, you know, scribal habits and the use of secretaries, you know, use of an amanuensis in the ancient world. Robert has our next question. I've heard that the terms psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Colossians 3.16, are the headings, titles for the psalms in the Septuagint. Is this true? And if so, is there any reason to believe that Paul is, direct, is directing the Colossian believers to sing anything other than the 150 biblical psalms in the passage? Well, I, I can handle the second part of the question with the first. It, no, this isn't really plausible. So the second part of the question just sort of falls by the wayside. Um, again, there's no, let's just put it this way. The, the argument doesn't make sense for several reasons. Uh, this has me wondering if Robert is a, is a worship leader under assault somewhere. <laughs> but uh, it, it, the argument doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a couple of reasons. One if you search for the term psalmoi, that's the plural, 
a nominative plural in the Septuagint, you'll find that it occurs in certain passages that aren't the Psalms and that are not really referring to the content of the Psalms. An example would be 1 Samuel 16, 18. So this is this is the same chapter where David is is the shepherd boy and you know Samuel you know has come to town and is going to anoint him and David's out in the field when Samuel's looking at his brother. So David you know he's not king. He hasn't really done anything except ten sheep. So there he is, okay? And in 1 Samuel 16:18 you get this reference. One of the young men answered, "Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skilled in playing." A man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, man of good presence, the Lord is with him. So David would have was out there, you know, because again, he's a young man. This is before he has any status. It's before the David and Goliath, you know, thing in chapter 17. So somebody knows that there's this shepherd kid out there that can play a mean harp, <laughs> right? He knows music. He's skillful in playing. You know, the the, the skillful in playing idea is is the same term. So he's singing things. It, it doesn't say that he is writing them. It's just sort of a, a neutral reference using this term because he's singing songs. He might be composing them. We don't know. It's just There's nothing that requires it. Nothing elsewhere that states that David was out there saying, well, so, you know, I'm going to be writing songs here. And I'm going to collect them because I'll, I'll, I'll bet masses of Israelites will want to read these and sing them themselves. I mean, there's, there's no indication of that. He's trying to put his time to good use. Okay, he's he's entertaining himself or maybe some somebody else. So you have you have sort of neutral references to the, you know that that use the term. Second, the last term, the spiritual songs, is you know odice, which gets translated in English as odes, and it kind of undermines the idea because the term or the under the, under, undermines the idea of the question that we're only referring to the 150 you know, psalms here in, in Paul's reference to psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Because the odes, there are plenty of odes that were composed prior to Paul's time that are not in the 150 psalms. Some of them are in the pseudepigraphical literature. Some of them you know, wind up in the Septuagint, again, which Paul has access to. So the term is used you know, widely, again, outside of the biblical material. It's also used in the Septuagint of unnamed music prior to the creation of the Psalter, Judges 5.12, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, break out in a song, break out in an ode. It's the word odai. Uh, you have it used in, in places in Scripture, in the Septuagint, again, that are not the Psalms. Exodus 15.1, the Song of Moses. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord saying, so on and so forth. Again, it's not in the Psalms, Deuteronomy 32, 44. Moses came and recited all the words of this song, Deuteronomy 32, in the hearing of the people, he and Joshua, the son of Nun. Uh, again, it's not the Psalms. So you, you can't really say that when Paul penned, you know, hey, sing to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that he was isolating his thoughts to the 150 Psalms that we have in the Psalter. I would also you know, add that the logic of the question is, and it's kind of flawed because, and what I mean by that is this, just because the Psalms are a focus, okay, because you, you have Paul's reference to the Psalms, Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, just because the Psalms are a focus of that statement, you know, honestly, you know, that they're going to, they're going to form the bulk of what a Jewish believer would have known. And even Gentiles, again, because they're reading the Septuagint, that doesn't mean that other things are excluded. In other, in other words, Paul doesn't stick a prohibition in there. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and absolutely nothing else, because it's ungodly or whatever. You know, he, Paul doesn't actually express an exclusion of other things. You know, the logic is kind of akin to saying that since 2 Timothy 2.15, let me read that in ESV, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. King James has like study to show thyself approved, okay? This logic about the, the, the music here is akin to saying that, well, in light of what 2 Timothy 2.15 says, you know, part of being approved by God is rightly handling the word of truth, which is scripture, then we shouldn't be allowed to read anything else. It's just silly. 
that's not the point of what's being said. The point is to elevate something or direct, you know, people to, to something else, something that they can sing. It's, it's not to exclude everything else. So I, it, the argument, the approach, the argument just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. All right. Mark has our last question. I was hoping that Mike could spend three or four minutes giving a rundown of how the amanuenses use may have factored into some of the work by other New Testament writers. This mm-hmm. comes to mind with the thought of his comments on the authorship of Hebrews as being someone who was at a very high level of Greek grammar usage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mark also emailed me this, and I thought this was worth tacking on because hey, it's Colossians. So we might as well. This is going to be more than three or four minutes because I had I had uh, come across um, – I can't remember what year the book is, but it's a it, it's actually a book on first century letter writing uh, and the use of amanuenses. Um, let me just look at the uh, 2004. E. Randolph Richards. The title is Paul and First Century Letter Writing: Colon Secretaries, Composition, and Collection. It's a it's an InterVarsity Press title from 2004. So I'm going to read parts of this. Um, it's probably a little overkill on what Mark is asking, but I think he will find it interesting and maybe somebody else out there in the audience will too. So this, I mean, let me read first before I get to, to Richard's, I, I was more familiar with Comfort's book, Encountering the Manuscripts, which is uh, an introduction to New Testament textual criticism. So let me read a little section from that and then I'll go to Richard's book. Because Richard's, I think, is more focused, but what what Comfort says is still worthwhile here. Comfort writes, according to the custom of the day, the amanuensis or secretary of official documents was often the same person who carried the document to its destination and read it aloud to its intended audience. Since this person had been present at the time of writing, he could explain to the hearers anything that needed explaining. Since most people were not literate, on average only 10% of the population in Hellenistic times could read, they depended on oral reading for communication. Thus, for example, some of the epistles written by Paul could have been delivered by his amanuensis, who would then read the letter to the church and explain anything that needed explaining. In this light, it is possible that Tychicus was Paul's amanuensis for Ephesians and Colossians. He wrote down the epistles for Paul as Paul dictated and then delivered them to the Ephesians and Colossians. Most likely, the letter to the Ephesians is the encyclical epistle that traveled with Tychicus to Ephesus. And again, if, let me just stop there. If you if you Assume that he is the amanuensis. That makes a lot of sense. You know, we just don't know for sure. So back to the quotation. Let's see. It's most likely again, Ephesians is the, the missing letter to Laodicea. This epistle is probably one and the same as the letter Paul mentions in Colossians 4.16, where he tells the Colossians, see to it that you also read the letter from Laodicea. This language indicates that a letter, presumably written by Paul, would be coming to the Colossians from Laodicea. Since it is fairly certain that Ephesians was written and sent at the same time as Colossians, Tychicus carrying both epistles, and again was very likely Paul's amanuensis for both, it can be assumed that Paul would expect that the encyclical epistle known as Ephesians would eventually circulate from Colossae to Laodicea. So that's what Comfort says. Now I want to read you, um, Richards has a much more, I mean he has a whole book on Again, secretaries, composition, collection, you know, how procedurally how this was done, drawn from contemporary Greek and Roman sources, you know, how how letter writing, especially. So what 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 I'm gonna read you here and what Richards' book focuses on is Paul. And so this is about the writing of, the, of letters, not necessarily the gospels, but but letters, which is you know a good part of the New Testament. So Richards begins this way. He says, Paul's writings show clear evidence of careful composition. They were not dashed off one evening in the flurry of mission activity. And then he quotes Betts, which is a major commentary, commentator on Colossians. Betts says, The very employment of an amanuensis, a secretary, rules out a haphazard writing of the letter and suggests the existence of Paul's draft and the copy by an amanuensis or a sequence of draft, composition, and copy. Uh, that's, that's the end of Betts's quote. In other words, if you're going to use an amanuensis, you would use that guy. Okay, there, there's there's going to be some process of dictation and then talking about you know how to say this and how to say that and oh well that, hey that sounds better than what I have let's cross that line off and replace it. You're, there's going to be a process to producing this letter that by definition the end product is going to be a careful thing. It's going to be well put together, well crafted. It's going to hit all all the things that it needs to hit, so on and so forth. 
So Betts is saying, if you're going to use one of these, you know, secretaries, you know, th this is to be expected. It's not just a haphazard, I mean, I got to fire this thing off and here you go. Uh, Paul's going to put some thought into this. Again, that makes a lot of sense. Now, elsewhere, Richard says, the use of a secretary is complicated further by the flexibility available to the sender. The author could grant to the secretary complete, much, little, or no control over the content, style, and even the form of the letter. The examination of ancient letters below, and then he's going to go into a bunch of these, reveals that the role of the secretary may be described as a spectrum. At one extreme, the secretary was a transcriber who had no input in the letter, taking strict dictation from the author. At the other extreme, the secretary composed the letter for the author. Most letters fell somewhere in, in the middle, somewhere in between. On this spectrum, we can mark the two clear extremes. The middle area is less clearly defined. In the case of a transcriber, the author dictated the letter that was then recorded verbatim by the secretary. If a final polished copy was prepared later, the contents remained unchanged. In this role, the secretary was merely a transcriber. On the other extreme, the secretary might be the true composer of the letter. In this role, the author instructed his secretary to send a letter to someone for some general purpose without specifying the exact contents. For example, an author could tell the secretary to write a letter to an associate in a particular town to tell him that he had been providentially delayed in coming and that when he was able, he would visit. It was possible to compose a personal letter from such general guidelines because of the highly stereotyped nature of most Greco-Roman letters, including even personal letters. The gray area in between these two extremes needs further elaboration. In this middle area, the secretary contributed in some way to the content of the letter. Perhaps the secretary, who usually had more training in letter writing than the author, edited the author's contents to conform better to epistolary standards. For example, the writer recited his letter while the secretary made extensive notes or perhaps even gave a rough draft to the secretary. In this role, the secretary was more like an editor because he was responsible for minor decisions about syntax and vocabulary and style. He remained, however, within the strict guidelines of the writer's oral or written draft. The secretary could also be permitted more latitude, working from notes that were far less extensive. In this broader role, the form, syntax, vocabulary, and style, as well as specific pieces of content, were contributed by the secretary, who usually was more experienced in matters of epistolary expression, while the general content, perhaps the argumentation, remained the author's. Thus, the secretary's role ranged from transcriber to contributor to composer, again, or to this editorial idea. So then he proceeds you know, to sort of elaborate on all that in his book. And then he, he, I mean, he even talks about things like dictation speed, because the examples he pulls out, he, he has an example from Cicero and Seneca, Plutarch, uh, uh, Pliny the Younger. Again, there's even evidence of shorthand in letters, where scribes, the, the, if you see shorthand in a letter, it's probably the guy's just dictating. He's rattling it off and the scribe's using some shorthand. Then he'll go back and then put, put all that in, into words that everybody knows, because not everybody knows shorthand. And you even have that process going on. So Richard's book talks about a lot of these features that you find in contemporary examples. But at the end of the day, we don't actually know, you know, what Paul procedurally did. Did he, did he use one of these methods or all of them? You know, did, did, he, did he shun some and, you know, favor others? You know, we, we just don't know. What we know is that he used an amanuensis. And, and agreeing with Betts here, that argues that this wasn't just something that he's like, okay, I got five minutes now, I got I to gotta shoot this letter off to the Ephesians. <laughs> no, there was a lot more thought put into it. You know, procedurally, this is something that's going to not just get, you know, spieled out and then sent, you know, where's the UPS envelope? I got to get this thing out of my hair as soon as possible. You know, I hope it's Amazon Prime. You know, we, we, there's nothing like that. They're going to take some time. You know, Paul is going to make sure that he he addresses what needs to be addressed on any given occasion. And I, I think we can we can conclude from you know things like the end of Paul's letters when he he says hi to people and he makes personal comments. Paul's in the room. This isn't a case where Paul just gives some vague instructions and then at the end the scribe just sort of makes people up. No, Paul is in the room. He has a personal attachment to a number of these people. And it's not just at the end of the letters, you know, when, when Paul does these personal things in 
in, in the course of his letters. And, and while scribes, while an amanuensis might be skilled professionally in how you construct a letter, what the proper form is, okay, Paul is the one who's expert in the scriptures. Okay, it's, it's Paul that needs to produce that, that kind of content. But he's working with an amanuensis in some way. So I, I think what we learn through this is, again, going back to Betz's pithy comment about, you know, if you're going to use one of these guys, then you make the best use of them. It's not just a robot. This is another individual. Hey, is this clear? Is there something you don't understand? Or, or that person might suggest something like, well, you know, I know, I know, you know, lots of people over in Colossae, and if you said it this way, they'll get it. You know, if, you know. I mean, there, there's going to be some give and take here. So it, it, it's kind of fascinating, but at the end of the day, we don't actually precisely know. And it, it might heighten the significance of Paul at the end of a letter like Colossians saying, hey, I'm putting my own hand to this. You know, I, I'm not. You know, if you go back and read that other article that we talked about in Colossians 4, if Paul can write, and again, there, there's, there's some, it's not just speculation. There are some good reasons to think a, a case can be made that Paul wrote the letter to Philemon himself. Um, if that's the case, Paul's saying, look, I'm not just somebody who can't write and has to dictate everything and, and hope I get a good, you know, hope this guy's worth my money. I can write. Okay. And, and, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put, you know, the, 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 you know, the, this final sort of indication in my letter, I'm going to sign this with my own hand, maybe even in big letters again, for why ever he would say that, who knows? Uh, again, it, it's all speculative at, at, at a number of these points, but I think at the very least we can know that Paul approached his letters with care and that, again, because of the nature of their content, they're not something that just anybody could produce in terms of content. Yes, maybe the form of the letter, because letters do follow form. You can read a study of New Testament epistles, and you're going to run into that every time. You know, what, what were the form, you know, the, the stock elements of how we do a letter? We do this too. Dear so-and-so. I mean, I remember in grade school being taught how to write a letter. There's, you know, the opening salutation. Then you, you, what you do in the first paragraph is a bit formulaic. You know, you talk about the weather, or whatever. You know, how you doing? There's a greeting, okay, an extended. You know, I mean, they're just parts of writing a letter. At the end, you know, you sign off in certain ways, sincerely. You know, Mike. Okay, I was taught to do this. It's a very simplistic thing. You know, as a child in, in grade school, you know, that they they taught us how to do that. But anyone who's been to law school knows there are ways to write a legal brief, brief so that the person who reads it knows that you're competent. Because if you don't do it that way, they're going to think you're incompetent. How in the world did you get a law degree? Okay, there are just ways to do certain things in the literate world that have to be learned and observed, both you know, for the sake of communication and also for the sake of, of having the, the person on the other end feel confident that the person who wrote this knows what they're talking about. So yes, an amanuensis is important to get all those things right. So that Paul can't be accused of being a hack, but on the other hand, it's Paul. I mean, and, and Paul has has a command of of the scriptures. You know, he has, he has a command of doctrine. He spent a lot of time, you know, with the the original apostles and so on and so forth. That content isn't something that can just be produced by anybody. It has to be produced by someone who was there, at least in terms of the, the post resurrection, you know, context, and who knows the scriptures well. So, again, I think it's instructive just to take this little rabbit trail. All right, Mike. Well, that's all the questions we have for this episode. So, is there anything else you'd like to mention? This is it. If you have any more Colossians uh, things to get off your chest, now's the time to do it. No, I think, I think, I think that's all I have for, for the episode. So, good questions. All right. Yep. We appreciate everybody sitting in their questions. Please continue to do so at tracestrickland at gmail.com. And, uh, again, I want to thank Mike for answering their questions and everybody else for sending in those questions. And uh, I want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 